are running a little late. <clears throat> Robert Spencer is the director of JihadWatch.org, a program of the David Horowitz Freedom Center, and the author of 16 books, including the New York Times bestsellers, The Politically Incorrect Guide to Islam and the Crusades, and The Truth About Muhammad. His latest book is The Complete Infidel's Guide to Iran. We do have that one here this evening. Coming in 2017, a little later this summer, is The Complete Infidel's Guide to Free Speech and Its Enemies. Spencer has led seminars in Islam and Jihad for the FBI, the U.S. Central Command, U.S. Army Command, and General Staff College. He has also briefed the U.S. Army's Asymmetric Warfare Group, Joint Terrorism Task Force, Justice Department's Anti-Terrorism Advisory Council, and the U.S. Intelligence Committee. He has discussed jihad, Islam, and terrorism at a workshop consulted by the U.S. State Department German Foreign Ministry. He is a consultant with the Center for Security Policy and Vice President of American Freedom and Defense Initiative. Spencer is a weekly columnist for PJ Media and Front Page Magazine and has written many hundreds of articles about jihad and Islamic terrorism. His articles on Islam and other topics have appeared in LA Times, the San Francisco Examiner, New York Post, the Washington Times, Dallas Morning News, and many, many others. He's also served as a contributing writer to the Investigative Project on Terrorism and an adjunct fellow with the Free Congress Foundation. Spencer has a master's in religious studies from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and has been studying Islamic theology, law, and history in depth since 1980. His work has aroused the ire of the foes of freedom and their dupes. In October 2011, Muslim Brotherhood links Linked groups wrote to Homeland Security Advisor and former CIA Director John Brennan demanding that Spencer be removed as trainer for the FBI and military groups where he taught about the belief system of Islamic jihadists. Brennan immediately complied. As all of our counterterrorism training manuals were scrubbed of all mentions of Islam and jihad, Spencer has been banned by the British government from entering the UK for pointing out accurately that Islam has doctrines of violence against unbelievers. He has been invited by name to convert to Islam by a senior member of Al-Qaeda. Would you give a warm welcome to Mr. Robert Spencer. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for coming out tonight. And I especially want to thank Isaac, because he made it all clear to me tonight, actually. The governments of Europe and North America are actually following out the foreign policy of John Lennon. John Lennon is the architect of the New World Order. And I never realized that until tonight. Imagine there's no countries. <laughs> Nothing to kill or die for. What we have is in Europe, as we saw with the Swedish immigration video, and what we have increasingly in the United States, is the idea that we are going to erase all distinctions between people. That is the globalist internationalist agenda. We're going to bring in large numbers of people with of different races and different ethnicities and vastly different religious and philosophical perspectives. And the idea behind it all is to make every place pretty much like every other place. So it'll save on tourism expenses <laughs> because you won't have to go to Jakarta. Jakarta's coming here. You won't have to go to Istanbul, Istanbul will be in the backyard. Every place will be like every other place. Every place will be just as squalid and dirty and dangerous as everywhere in the third world is now. And then, there'll be nothing to kill or die for. Because what's the point? What, you're going to conquer Europe? Why? It's the same as where you are. What's the big deal? And so, everywhere there will be peace. It's the John Lennon philosophy for world peace. And I never realized that John Lennon is the towering philosopher of our age, until tonight. But this is, in all seriousness, the guiding philosophy of the governments of Europe, and the governments of Europe as well as the government of Canada 
and certainly large segments of the government of the United States, but there is serious pushback now. And the Leninists, as it were, are fighting tenaciously to stay in power. Right now, of course, we have the election in France, and we have the nationalist, the French candidate, the only, the, there are only two candidates left, the French candidate, Le Pen, and the Leninist candidate, Macron. And that's it. The question is whether France will be on, keep on being France and will recover its Frenchness or whether it will become just part of this wonderful global world order with no boundaries and no particular distinctive qualities whatsoever. And this is the choice, of course, that we have in the United States as well. We have been governed by a Leninist for the last eight years. And then something happened that they did not expect. Their next Leninist did not win the election. And the change... Yes. Pardon the Rubio moment. The change is remarkable. For eight years, Barack Obama was president of the United States, and we got used to thinking about things in a certain way, even we who were always opposed to him and his agenda. You can't help if you're a fish in the fishbowl to breathe in the water that's all around. And we did. But then Donald Trump became president. It reminds me of the parable of Plato's cave. Has anybody read Plato's Republic lately? Yeah. Really nice. I haven't, e I haven't either. Um, <laughs> but I did remember this from college, that there's the parable of the cave. And the parable of the cave is a group of people, and they live in a cave. They can't get out. They're chained up in there. And they are facing away from the light. So all they can see are shadows on the wall. And they're, since that's all they can see, and they just sit there all day, they are very interested in the shadows on the wall. And they study them, they catalog them, they know all about the shadows on the wall. That is, as far as they're concerned, reality. But then, something happens, they get unchained, they get brought out into the sunlight, and they're blinking, it's so bright, and it's so clear, and it's so vivid, it's extraordinary. And all the realities of the things that they saw in shadow are now clear to them. And some of them are overjoyed. Some of them think, wow, this is great. Now I see things the way they really are. And some of them think, wow, this is really scary. I want to go back to the cave and look at the shadows. And that is the struggle in the United States today and within the Trump administration itself. Barack Obama, eight years, we got used to the idea that it would be an uphill battle. If we wanted to stand for the defense of the United States, we were going to have to fight against the American political and media establishment. And we got used to the idea that if we are going to fight for the defense of the United States and the freedom of our children and our children's children, then most people are going to think there's something wrong with that. And most people are going to think we're racist, bigoted, Islamophobic hate mongers. And then Donald Trump came along and he said, we're going to defend the United States. We're going to put America first. We're going to build a wall. We're going to fight against radical Islamic terrorism, which of course Obama did not dare to enunciate the name of the enemy. And we're going to defend the United States. And it's like getting out of the cave and seeing things as they are. But there are powerful forces wanting to draw us back into the shadows. And that is the situation today. The Trump administration promised to drain, drain the swamp, right? Unfortunately, the swamp is full of swamp creatures <laughs> who don't want to leave. And they are proving to be very powerful and well entrenched. And right now, it's anybody's guess which way it's going to go. A lot of people say, just the other day, I was on some show and the guy was saying, it's all lost. He's all, he's given up. He's been co-opted. And I think, no, 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 it's too early to tell. 
This is April 2017. He's only been in office for a few months. Give the man a chance. He yes. promised he was going to do certain things, and I still doubt that he is going to allow the entire impetus of his administration to be lost and its entire purpose, the whole reason why he got elected, to be blunted. But right now there's a tremendous struggle. Remember, he scolded Hillary Clinton during the debates. He excoriated Obama many times during the summer for refusing to say radical Islamic terrorism. And as Dan noted during the introduction, I used to train FBI, CIA, military groups about the nature of the enemy. I would go in with the Quran and tell them about the Quran and tell them about Muhammad so they would understand the mindset of the people we were trying to fight. You can't defeat an enemy you don't understand. It's an adage as old as warfare itself. But Obama stopped all that such that if you were to join the FBI today you would, and say you wanted to go into counter-terror, you would learn all about right-wing extremists, that's us. Yeah. <laughs> you would learn all about militiamen and constitutionalists and so on. You would not learn a thing, not a word, not a syllable about Islamic jihadis. There is no jihad terror threat as far as the Obama administration is concerned, and that is still the policy. I have every confidence that it will be changed, but right now, all that's still in place. And Trump, when he spoke about radical Islamic terrorism, although he was widely ridiculed and vilified for doing so, he was signaling, we are going to speak about the motivating ideology of the enemy, which is the indispensable prerequisite to defeating that enemy. And then <clears throat> he began to appoint people who were swamp creatures. Notably, H.R. McMaster, the national security advisor who came in after Michael Flynn was removed, which is still a story, I think, that the full details of which have yet to be told. But in any case, McMaster was one of the foremost exponents of the Obama policy of dissembling about the nature and motivating ideology of the enemy. And one of the first things he did was gather together in the National Security Council and say, we're not going to talk about Islamic terrorism. We don't want to offend Muslims. We're not going to speak about the ideology that fuels jihad terrorism. We're going to pretend it doesn't exist, which was exactly the Obama strategy. And so it's extremely strange that he's there, and there are others who are there. And it's extremely strange that many, many things that he promised to do are not happening or are stalled in very ambiguous ways. One of the most notably, of course, is the idea of the so-called Muslim ban, which is not a Muslim ban at all. But he did say during the campaign that he was going to enact a moratorium, a temporary moratorium, on Muslim immigration into the United States until we can figure out what's going on. By which he was referring to the fact that you cannot vet the people coming in. And you can't. There is no way. The Quran in chapter 3, verse 28, if you have your Quran, you can open to that passage. You don't have it? You didn't bring it? I never go anywhere without mine. Anyway, the Quran in chapter 3, verse 28 says, Let not believers take unbelievers as their friends and protectors in preference to believers. Whoever does this has nothing to do with Allah. Unless you are doing it to guard yourselves against them. And the passage, unless you're doing it to guard yourselves against them, is, it is understood, is explained in the classic mainstream commentaries on the Quran as meaning you can pretend to be the friends of the unbelievers in order to gain an advantage over them or to protect yourself from them. But you are not sincerely their friends. Now this doesn't mean that in always in every case, if you have a Muslim friend, that he's not really your friend and is just pretending because the doctrine of any religion and how every person puts it into practice are two different things. Just like every Christian doesn't love his enemies and turn the other cheek. But that doesn't mean that Jesus didn't say that. And it's the same thing in the Quran. Now, that doctrine of deception opens the door, however, for deception. 
you can have people come in and you want to vet them. So you say, as, as the immigration forms still say, are you a member of any terrorist group? <laughs> and they can say no. What a shock that they would lie about that. Not only that, actually, they don't even have to lie about that because there's an asterisk on the form. You can look this up. Congressman Tom Tancredo told me this, and he was trying to get this changed when he was still in Congress. There's an asterisk on the form that says, are you a member of any terrorist group? And the asterisk goes down to the bottom of the page. Saying yes on this question will not necessarily disqualify you for entry. I kid you not. But anyway, no matter how sophisticated you make the questioning, no matter how thorough you vet, you're not going to be able to keep out people who are sworn to deceive and who are willing to dissemble. And they think that they are serving their God by dissembling. It's not something they think is anything wrong. They think it's an active virtue. So they don't have any pangs of conscience about it. You know, lie detector tests, they work because your blood pressure goes up or you start getting nervous because you're lying. That only works in Western civilization. <laughs> if you are taught from birth that if you're under pressure, especially from people who are outside your religious group, then you can and should and must lie, well, your blood pressure is going to be fine because Allah is blessing you for dissembling against the kufar. So, how are you going to vet for that? You can't. And so, Donald Trump was saying there needs to be some kind of a moratorium a temporary block on people coming into the country. When he became president, he enacted it in executive orders, first on seven Muslim countries, and then he dropped off Iraq after assurances from the president of Iraq that they would vet people coming in. Yes, yes. And both of those were struck down, even though there is a very clear statute in American law that empowers the president to place restrictions on immigration. And there are virtually no restrictions on the restrictions he can place. But the, both of the bans, both of the blocks on his bans, both of the blocks on his executive orders ignored that law. Judges are supposed to interpret the law and determine whether some new measure is in accord with it or not. But both of these leftist activist judges ignored the law altogether to pursue their leftist policies, their Leninist, internationalist, globalist policies. And that is manifest abuse of power. And those judges ought to have been immediately subjected to impeachment proceedings for abuse of their judicial power. The Trump administration did not do that. Why not? Swamp creatures. The Trump administration also did not pursue many other avenues it still has open to it to restrict the refugee flow while these blocks are in place and before they've been considered by the Supreme Court. It did not do, them. do it. It's clear that there is a war within the Trump administration between the swamp creatures and those who want to drain the swamp. Which one will prevail is anybody's guess. But I'll tell you, the stakes are so high that if the swamp creatures prevail, all, all kidding aside, then that could be the end of the United States as a free republic. And I am not overstating the case because you cannot possibly, as we see in the example of Sweden, bring in large numbers of people, even if they never commit any more terror attacks, you cannot bring in large numbers of people who have a radically different view of how society should be ordered and think that their radically different view of society is superior to that of the place they're coming to and that they should replace it. You can't bring in large numbers of people like that and think there's not going to be any civil strife. You are bringing in, we are bringing in, as the United States, large numbers of people who believe that Sharia, Islamic law, is the immutable and perfect law of Allah, the only true God. And that that law is superior to any human law, because they don't think that it's a human law itself, they think it's handed down by Allah, 
and that their responsibility before Allah is to work to replace the human law with divine law. And that divine law, so-called, denies the freedom of speech, criminalizes criticism of Islam, which we're already well on the way to doing anyway, and denies the freedom of conscience if you decide to leave Islam because you don't think it's true, or you, and you want to become a Christian or something else, or nothing at all, you're liable to be killed. Denies equality of rights to women. Allows for polygamy, which essentially reduces women to the status of commodities. Allows for wife beating. The Quran, chapter 4, verse 34, you can look it up. Good women are obedient. As for those that are not, give them a warning, send them to separate beds, and beat them. Spousal abuse is found everywhere, but only in Islam does it have divine sanction. Does Allah himself, the only God, say, yes, beat her. There are spousal abuse laws in the United States. There are spousal abuse laws in Great Britain, too. And in Great Britain, there are also Sharia courts. The Sharia courts are not very old, but they're growing all the time. There were 85 around the country at last count, but I'm sure there are many more. And when the Sharia courts were implemented, instituted, it was about 10, 12 years ago. And there were all kinds of assurances in Britain that these courts are only for personal matters. Marriage law, divorce, inheritance, etc. They will not deal, we were promised, by Muslim leaders and non-Muslim leaders alike. They will not deal with criminal matters. Those will be referred immediately to the British courts. So they started getting a lot of spousal abuse cases. My husband beat me, the woman would say. And the Sharia judges would say, we'll go back and try to please him more energetically. And they did not refer the spousal abuse cases to the criminal courts. They lied. They said they would and they didn't. Imagine that. And this is in microcosm. It's become a big problem in Britain now. And they're trying to investigate the Sharia courts, but they don't want to offend Muslims, and so they have to do it very gingerly and carefully. But the problem is, what are you going to do about women's rights when you are allowing for the presence of Sharia? What are you going to do when a woman is beaten? Is it alright or isn't it? It can't be both. It can't be alright for some people and not for others. It's one or the other. So the Western states are asking for civil strife and asking for trouble by bringing in large numbers of people who believe that Sharia is the unalterable law of Allah. And there's no avoiding this strife. The more Muslims come in, the more likely that strife is to come and come quickly. We see that Sweden is now, Stockholm is the rape capital of the world, and why? Because the Quran says, chapter 33, verse 59, it says, let women draw their veils over their bosoms so they are not molested. So if they're not veiled, you see, the subtext is, go ahead and molest them. They have it coming. Not only that, but the Quran allows in several places, and I'm giving you the citations, you can check up on me on this. Chapter 4, verse 3, chapter 4, verse 24, chapter 23, verse 1 to 6, chapter 33, verse 50, and chapter 70, verse 30. All of those verses speak about the captives of the right hand. Who are the captives of the right hand? The captives of the right hand are infidel women, non-Muslim women who've been captured in battle or captured in wartime. And they can be used as sex slaves. This is right from the Quran. And it's perfectly legal. People were horrified when Boko Haram in Nigeria captured those girls and made them into sex slaves. You remember Michelle Obama holding up the sign, hashtag bring back our girls. And Boko Haram was embarrassed and brought back all the girls. <laughs> Not really, they still have them. And the ISIS group, the Islamic State, did the same thing a few years later. And the world was horrified and we were told again and again, well, this has nothing to do with Islam. It has everything to do with Islam. It's right out of the Quran. And it's going to happen here. Because when you bring in a believer in the Quran, you're going to get actions that are sanctioned by the Quran. It's not rocket science. So Trump wants to do some small things to limit that. And he's being resisted. We're told that he's Hitler. Literally Hitler. Because he wants to restrict immigration. Now think about that. Hitler in 1940 restricted not immigration, but emigration. 
There weren't really a whole lot of people clamoring to get into Nazi Germany. But there were lots of Jews trying to get out. And Hitler stopped them in 1940 because he wanted to kill them. Trump wants to stop Muslims from immigrating so they won't kill us. This is not the same thing. And you can say, well, Spencer, see, you're being a racist, bigoted, Islamophobe. Not all of them are going to kill us. Some of them are perfectly reasonable people who just want to come here to get a better life. Yes, absolutely, granted. And this is the hard choice that we have today. We either keep out some people who are harmless, or we let in some people who are harmful. Is there another alternative? There is not. There is no other alternative. You keep out some people who are harmless, or you let in some people who are harmful. The left, the Democratic Party, the globalist, Leninist establishment, they are saying, you have to let in these people who are harmful so that you can let in the people who are harmless. You have to put up with an increasing number of jihad mass murders of your own people so that these harmless people will not be inconvenienced and so that there won't be any countries and nothing to kill or die for and we'll all march together into the wonderful Leninist future. Right, yeah. Well, either we do that and die or we stop them and live. There's no other choice. So which one is going to happen is anybody's guess right now. And we can hope that Trump will remember that he was elected promising to do something about this and that he will get back on the horse that he's been knocked off twice and fight again. Now with Judge Gorsuch on the Supreme Court, maybe there can be a Supreme Court decision which, if it is sane, which not all Supreme Court decisions are, will reaffirm that the President has a perfectly clearly delineated right in American law to legislate about, to, to, to regulate rather, about immigration and allow him to do so. And initially, when the first executive order came out, Reince Priebus, the chief of staff, said there are going to be more in this line. And so we can hope that that will get back on track. But there are powerful enemies, and it's not just the global Leninists. Uh, in many cases, it is the church or synagogue that we go visit every week. The Catholic Church gets about $90 million a year. $90 million a year of our taxpayer dollars to the Catholic Church for refugee resettlement. Not coincidentally, the Catholic Church a few years back was pressuring Obama to take, bring in more refugees. <coughs> Why? They get money. Abdul Razak Ali Artan was a Muslim in Ohio State University. And he went into a building and he set off a fire alarm and he got into his car and as the students ran out of the building, he rammed them with his car. And then he got out of his car and started to stab them. This was uh, last summer or a couple summers ago. And you remember, it was right around here. Goodness. My cousin was in the next building. I'm glad. I hope he was safe. Yeah, he was safe. Thank God. In any case... It was Catholic Charities brought that young man here. And they've never been held accountable. Nobody is asking them, well, what's in it for you? You're getting $90 million, but do you have any regard for the dangers that you're subjecting people to by bringing these people in without properly vetting them, which is impossible in any case? Nobody is asking them that. And this is a very huge problem that we have liberal Christians, liberal Jews, who are, think, who are trying to guilt trip us and shame us into thinking that we are not really charitable people, not really good people, if we oppose this refugee flow. Well, I would submit to you that they are not really good people for demanding that we endanger our lives and the ch our children's lives and the lives of our children's children and that they are not really good people for taking our free and peaceful society and making it into a place where we never know when we go outside if we're going to come back alive. 
because we never know where they're going to strike. But of course, if you go to a meeting of some of these Christian groups, Catholic groups, Jewish groups, you can't talk about this because it is racist and bigoted and Islamophobic to do so. Have you ever heard that? Have you ever been called that? Isn't that funny? Well, you know, it's a concerted effort. It's a strategy that was adopted by the same people who are pushing all this upon us. You've heard the term Islamophobia. You have heard perhaps that you yourself are an Islamophobe. Any, any, anybody here ever accused of that? Yes? And of course, I'm the international poster boy for uh, Islamophobia. But, and you know, of course, it's a very big deal. There are international commissions devoted to studying Islamophobia and its root causes. And I think, hey, I could save you guys millions of dollars. <laughs> Stop with the Allahu Akbar, boom, and there won't be Islamophobia. It's easy. All you have to do is stop killing people and pointing to the Quran to explain why and people will like you better. <laughs> it's very simple. And of course you'll say, well Spencer, see here again you're being a racist, bigoted, Islamophobe because most Muslims don't do that. Well, let's talk about some unpopular and unwelcome truths. Yes, most Muslims are not jihad terrorists. Most Muslims are not going to kill us. Great. What are they doing about those who are? Yeah. A couple of weeks ago, I had the great honor of speaking at Truman State University in Kirksville, Missouri. And they were, as you may imagine, enraged that I was coming because I'm a racist, bigoted Islamophobe. And the, there was a petition drive and I read it, I thought, wow, this guy's really horrible. And then I realized, oh, they're talking about me. <laughs> and trying to get me canceled. And instead of canceling, because the uh, administrators had probably, without thinking through what they were doing, they had signed a contract and they didn't want to get sued. So they had to go ahead with me speaking, but they got a fellow from the Hamas linked Council on American Islamic Relations to speak right before me. And he was very smooth, he was very good. I mean, of course, they always are. As uh, Shakespeare said, the, the smiler with the knife under the cloak. And he, in his charming way, uh, said that I ought to be arrested and uh, various other things. But one of the things he said, disarmingly, you know, he shrugged his shoulders and looked a little pained and he said, what do you expect us to do? What do you expect us to do? Do you expect me to go to jihad meetings and tell them that they're not understanding Islam right? And I yeah. thought, yeah. 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 Sounds good. You claim that they're getting it all wrong. You claim they're misunderstanding and misinterpreting Islam. Why are you telling a bunch of non-Muslims about that instead of going to tell Muslims? And when it came my turn to speak, I did challenge the gentleman, who, uh, Mr. Faison Syed, who was very kind enough to stay for, uh, to hear me. And I said, what, what do you want? What do you think? Uh, what do I want you to do? How about this? How about a class, a program, in every mosque in Islamic school, where you condemn Al-Qaeda and ISIS, you explain to the young people in the mosque and the school why they should reject that understanding of Islam, never take up violence, accept being in a secular society that does not have an established religion, don't try to gain hegemony for Islam over other groups. How, how about that? A few little programs, some classes. What's the big deal? You would think that if they were sincere about actually opposing these jihad terrorists, then that would, these classes would already be in place, but there's not a single mosque or Islamic school anywhere in the United States or anywhere in the world that I know of that has any such program. And there are only a couple of Islamic groups around the world that have ever declared takfir on Osama bin Laden or other jihadis. Takfir is uh, Islamic excommunication. It's saying you're not really a Muslim. The jihadis do it all the time. They do it all the time so much that among Muslims they're often called takfiris. 
because they're always going around saying that some other group is not Muslim so they can kill them. But the establishment mainstream Muslim groups have not said that Osama bin Laden and ISIS and Al-Qaeda and all the rest of them and all the others who are killing in, in, in the name of Islam, they don't say they're not Muslim. Well, they condemn, they oppose this, they say it has nothing to do with Islam, and they vilify and excoriate us if we point out that the jihadis are quoting chapter and verse of the Quran. So why not do anything about it? Well, unfortunately, all the sects, all the mainstream sects, all the schools of Islamic law, schools of Islamic law, I mean not brick and mortar schools, there are various schools of Islamic legal thought to which pretty much every Muslim believes. There are four major ones, Shafi'i, Maliki, Hanafi, and Hanbali, among the Sunnis who are most Muslims, and then the Shiites have the Jafaris and some others, and these are ways of understanding Islam, uh, ways of interpreting the Quran and Islamic law. They agree on most everything. It's not like they're huge disagreements. But every Muslim is pretty much is part of one of these groups. They're not really like Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterians. They're not different denominations. They're just different schools of legal thought. There's not really any analogy to it in Judaism or Christianity. In any case, all of those schools of law teach that it is the responsibility of the Muslim community to wage war against non-Muslims and subjugate them under the rule of Islamic law. I didn't bring it tonight, but when I was at Truman State, I kind of had a feeling that the care guy was going to do this, and he did. When he was speaking, Mr. Syed, Mr. Care, he said that when Spencer gets up, you will hear the Islam of Osama bin Laden. It's not the Islam of 99.9% .9 of Muslims. It's the twisted, hijacked version of the terrorists and the right-wing extremists who want to vilify all Muslims by portraying it as mainstream Islam. That was me, see. So I, I saw that coming. I knew that was going to happen. So I brought with me a manual of Islamic law that is certified by Al-Azhar. Al-Azhar is the Islamic institution in Cairo where Barack Obama spoke, and he praised it as being a beacon of learning for over a thousand years. And he prayed, uh, the New York Times praised Al-Azhar right after 9-11 as being a wonderful bastion of Islamic moderation. Well, I have their law book, their Sharia book. You can get it in Amazon. It's translated, it's called Reliance of the Traveler. You maybe you have it. And in it, it says, Jihad means warfare against non-Muslims. In order to bring them in order to convert them to Islam or bring them into the Islamic social order, which means they're submitting to Islamic hegemony, denied basic rights, paying a special tax, and so on. So this is mainstream Islam from the foremost institution in Sunni Islam. It's not the hijacked version of Al-Qaeda or some right-wing Islamophobe. It's the real thing. But anyway, Islamophobia itself, you never heard the word before 10, 20 years ago, am I right? How is it that everybody started hating on Islam all of a sudden. What a strange coincidence. Care and Faisal Syed and all these people would say, well, it's because this well-funded cabal, <laughs> if only, this well-funded cabal of Islamophobes, Spencer, Brigitte Gabriel, Pamela Geller, Frank Gaffney, Claire Lopez, you know the group. Your speaker list. <laughs> We all found a way to make a lot of money by vilifying Muslims. And, well, this is another thing where I said that night in Truman State is, I ain't that good. Even if I wanted to make people hate Muslims, I'm just not that influential. The people, if anybody hates Muslims, it's because of Jokar and Tamerlan Tsarnaev, the Boston Marathon Jihad bombers, Nidam Ali Kassam, the Fort Hood Jihad massacre, Syed Rizwan Farouk and Tashfi Malik, the San Bernardino killers, Muhammad Abdul Aziz, who killed four Marines in Chattanooga, and on and on and on. And Bin Laden, and Baghdadi, and all the rest of them. That's why. But the term Islamophobia was cooked up in the late 90s by the Institu International Institute of Islamic Thought. Now, there are Islamophobia experts. 
who will tell you, oh no, no, Spencer's all wrong. It was in a book in France in 1910. Okay, yes, it was in a book in France in 1910. But as a concept that is used to intimidate us and to make us think there's something wrong with resisting jihad terror, it was chosen in the late 90s in a meeting of the International Institute of Islamic Thought, which is a Muslim Brotherhood organization. And the Brotherhood decided that they were going to use this term to make people think that they were in the wrong if they were against jihad terror. Now that sounds crazy, but that's the world we live in, is it not? Syed Rizwan Farouk and Tashfi Malik, the San Bernardino killers. They killed 15 people at a Christmas party in San Bernardino, December 2nd, 2015, right? Their neighbors, after the killings, said, yeah, you know, we thought there was something suspicious about them. There was all sorts of commotion there all through the night, people coming and going, suspicious looking characters. And then they were asked, well, did you call the police? Oh, no, no, we didn't want to commit any racial profiling. <laughs> They were afraid of being called Islamophobes. And so 15 people are dead in San Bernardino. There are many, many other examples of that. Nidal Malik Hassan, the Fort Hood killer, a major in the US Army, US Army psychiatrist, right? Killed 13 people at Fort Hood, November 4th, 2009, screaming Lak Lak Bar, which means Allah is greater, not God is great. Allah is greater than your God. And this is the declaration of how much greater he is. Here is his wrath. And he killed all those people. Now, Nidal Malik Hassan, a few years before that, a few years before that, had gotten grand rounds. Grand rounds is, uh, maybe some of you are physicians and you know this better than I, but apparently it's a, a, some sort of a lecture series where everybody in a department, like he was an army psychiatrist, so all the army psychiatrists would get together at specified intervals for grand rounds where one of them would speak about latest advances in the field, new discoveries in psychiatry. Nidal Malik Hassan's turn came around and he spent the whole grand rounds speaking about jihad. And he even referred to Hassan Akbar, who was an American soldier who murdered his commanding officers in Kuwait back in 2003. And he warned that Muslims would kill and imitate Hassan Akbar if they were in the military and made to fight against Muslims. And people were alarmed who's heard it. And they went to Nidal Malik Hassan's superiors and they complained. And Nidal Malik Hassan, what happened? Do you think he was disciplined? No. Do you think he was investigated? No. Do you think he was questioned? No. He was promoted. <laughs> he was also emailing back and forth with a fellow named Anwar al -Laki. Anwar al of course, was a, uh, an American born in New Mexico who was a jihad leader. He was involved with the 9-11 jihadis. He was involved with the Detroit bomber, the guy who set his underwear on fire on Christmas Day 2008, I believe it was, and tried to blow up an airplane. He was involved with Hassan. He was involved with many others. And he was talking to Al-Laki. There was an FBI agent who knew about this, and he said he would report to his superiors about it, and they said, this is not something we're interested in. And it happened again and again. And every time that Hassan would have an email exchange with Al-Laki, the, the FBI agent would go back again and say, they're at it again, they're talking, aren't you interested in this? Nope. And finally he flew, he was a, a, an agent in San Diego, he flew to Washington and he went to his superiors and he asked them, look, this guy is clearly dangerous. He's talking to a known jihad terror leader. Why are you not interested? And they said, Look, if we were going to track or investigate every Muslim soldier who is in touch with terrorists, we would do nothing else. <laughs> Can you imagine? Can you imagine 1943? If we were to track every German American in the US Army who's in touch with the Nazis, we'd do nothing else. Can you imagine? There's no chance that would have happened. 
but now it's routine. And so, because the, and I'll tell you, I am sure, I'm 100% sure of this. I don't know who his superiors are. I don't know where they are now. But I know this. They knew that if they did anything about Nidal Hassan, then it would be on CNN the next day. It would be in the New York Times, Islamophobia in the military. Pious Muslim soldier reprimanded simply for speaking about his faith. Details at 11. Am I right? Can you see it? And those guys' careers would have been ruined. They would have been done for. And so now, 13 more people are dead for fear of Islamophobia. The Islamophobia racket is working exactly the way it was supposed to, to make people frightened to act against suspicious Muslims who could be waging jihad. The idea of it is to remove all obstacles so that the jihad can advance unopposed and unimpeded. No problem. And this is part of a larger initiative against the freedom of speech itself. Islam forbids, Islamic law, as I told you a little while ago, Islamic law criminalizes criticism of Islam. The subjugated people, the dhimmis, what they want to make us into, the people who are submitted to the hegemony of the Muslims and accept the rule of the Muslims. Islamic law says that those people are protected. Their lives and their property are safe. If they accept all the discriminatory rules, they can't hold authority over Muslims, they can only have menial jobs, they cannot build new houses of worship or repair old ones, so their communities are always declining, Very, they have to pay the tax that the Muslims don't have to pay, and so on. All these rules, but they can still live as non-Muslims, unless they criticize Islam, and then, they, then they're to be killed. The blasphemy law is very strict in Islam. You criticize Muhammad, you should be killed. If you're a Muslim, same thing. The Organization of Islamic Cooperation, which is 57 Muslim countries, 57 Muslim governments in the world, they've been working for over 10 years now at the UN to bring that to the West, to bring blasphemy laws to the West. And it's working. We are already afraid. Maybe not the people in this room, but I know that all of us could give, you, give a list right now of 10 people. If I asked you, stop and make a list of 10 people who are not here and would never come here because they don't want to be considered Islamophobic or racist or bigoted, you would have no trouble making the list. Am I right? No trouble whatsoever. Not only that, but the criticism of Islam, if you do, if you do it, you will be killed. This idea has been internalized by the establishment media and the political class in the United States. It's obvious. In 2015, January 2015, the Charlie Hebdo magazine, satirical magazine in France, they went in, the jihadis went in and they massacred all the cartoonists. Why did they want to massacre the cartoonists? Because they drew Muhammad. You don't draw cartoons of Muhammad. You don't make fun of him. And if you do, you'll be killed. So they killed all those cartoonists. After that, to stand in solidarity with those people. See, then when, when they tell you, we're, if you do this, we're going to kill you, you have two choices and two choices only. You can not do what they want. You can submit and thereby reinforce the idea that violent intimidation works. Bullying works. Oh, yes, you said you're going to kill me if I do that, then I won't do it. Or you do it because you realize that the only chance that we have to, to remain as a free society is if we do what they don't want us to do. Why? Just to be contrary? Just to be uncharitable? Just to be rude and nasty and bigoted and Islamophobic? No. But in order to show that we will not bow to violent intimidation, we will not give in to bullying. And that's the best gift... That is the best gift that we can give to our children and our grandchildren. If we give them the gift of a society where we bowed to intimidation, where we bowed to bullying, we're only going to get more intimidation and more bullying. But if we show them, we ain't going to stand for it. We will stand up like Stéphane Charbonnier, Charb, the editor at Charlie Hebdo. He said, I would rather die standing up than live on my knees. Yeah. Then many of us will die standing up. And many of us will live 
standing up. Because the one thing that a bully can't take is when you stand up to him. And it folds away, but we have the courage to do that now. So Pamela Geller and I did a free speech event where we had a cartoon contest for the best cartoon of Muhammad. And we had an art exhibit of art of depicting Muhammad, many of it by Muslims, throughout the ages. It was the Muhammad Art Exhibit and Cartoon Contest. It's often erroneously referred to as Draw the Prophet Contest. We never called it that. He's not our prophet. But in any case, we had this event in May 2015 in Garland, Texas, and jihadis came and attacked it, as you may have heard. And we had spent well over $10,000 on security, and it worked. The security guys that we hired took out the jihadis, and everybody lived happily ever after. But wait, there's more. It came out recently that the FBI knew about this. They knew about these jihadis who came from Phoenix. They drove from Phoenix to Garland, which is right outside Dallas, in order to kill us. And the FBI knew they were coming. The FBI had an informant who was in touch with them. And he was encouraging them. Look, I'm all for FBI informants. I'm all for FBI people infiltrating groups of criminals in order to stop them. But this was an FBI agent infiltrating a group of criminals in order to encourage them. He told them, he texted them, tear up Texas. As in, kill Geller and me and as many other people as you can. He, as it just recently was, even more recently was revealed, was in the car behind the jihadis as they approached the event. Now, not only that, but the jihadis got out of the car and one of them shot one of our police officers that we had hired. He was not mortally wounded, he survived, he's fine. The informant took a picture of the guy who got shot right before he got shot. How did he know which guy to take a picture of? Unless he was in touch with the jihadis right up to the minute. The FBI knew that this attack was going to happen. And they had one guy there who was encouraging the attack to happen. The FBI knew that this attack was going to happen. And they didn't have 50 guys there ready to meet these people and stop them. They didn't have 100 SWAT team members there to take out the jihadis. We did have a SWAT team there. We hired them. They wanted us dead. There's no other con conclusion. You can say, well, Spencer, you're crazy. Why would the FBI? The FBI is here to protect Americans. Uh, now, that was true, but now it's full of swamp creatures and Leninists. And look, Barack Obama, what did he say right after the Benghazi massacre, which he blamed falsely on a video of Muhammad that is implicitly blaming our freedom of speech and saying, if we just shut up and stop criticizing Muhammad, this kind of thing won't happen, see? And what did he say? He went to the UN and he said, the future must not belong to those who slander the prophet of Islam. In other words, the future does not belong to the First Amendment. The future does not belong to the freedom of speech, which is the foundation and indispensable aspect of a free society. The future instead belongs to those who are quiet and go along and don't dare to criticize the prophet of Islam for fear of getting killed or accused of Islamophobia, or both. I say both because if they do get me one day, you know the New York Times will say, well, he had it coming. He insulted the prophet. They wanted us dead so that they could say, look, see what happens when you slander the prophet of Islam? See what happens? We have to be more careful and respectful. We have to respect the noble religion of Islam. I ask you, we can talk about it in the Q&A. You tell me if there's some other way to understand that. But when the FBI knows there's going to be a murderous jihad attack, and they have one guy there who's encouraging them, 
and they don't send anybody else for the protection of the people who are there, what other conclusion can be drawn? And this is how far advanced the war against the freedom of speech has gotten. Look, remember that the Obama administration also signed on to Resolution 1618 of the United Nations Human Rights Council, which calls for the criminalization, that calls on member states of the UN to criminalize incitement to religious hatred. Now, what's incitement to religious hatred? All the people that when I spoke at Truman State University, they said, this guy's terrible, he's hateful, so he shouldn't come. And I said, well, I don't think I'm hateful, I'm really a pretty mild fellow. I don't know, you can ask my wife, but... <laughs> Fact is, the idea that to speak honestly about how jihadis use the texts and teachings of Islam to justify violence, the idea that that's hateful, that's a big lie that's been propagated by these organizations all, all through these years in order to intimidate us and make us silent. And now they want, us, want to criminalize incitement to religious hate. And short of criminalizing, you already have Facebook and Twitter tell you I have the website jihadwatch.org. Updated many times daily with news and commentary about jihad activity in the United States and around the world. Go now, jihadwatch.org. <laughs> jihadwatch.org, every day, for years and years and years, every day, would get about 20,000 to 25,000 referrals from Facebook and 2,000 from Twitter. Every day. It would go up and down depending on the news, but it was around there. February 11th, 2017, suddenly it was 2,000 referrals from Facebook and 100 from Twitter. And it's been about there ever since. What they've done is they've blocked off hate speech. Now is it really hate to stand up and say we need to defend ourselves against this violent and aggressive and supremacist ideology? Well, obviously not. But once they have portrayed it as such, and once it's been accepted as such by the globalist internationalist elites, then obviously we can't imagine there's no countries and nothing to kill or die for if people are still pointing out that Islamic jihadis are killing us. We have to be ignorant and complacent about that and fat and happy and everything will be okay. And so there is a tremendous struggle going on and I don't want to be entirely bleak about it. The fact that Donald Trump is president at all, the fact that Britain voted to leave the European Union, the fact that Marine Le Pen is in the second round of the French presidential race is all, all signs that the swamp, even if it's not being actively drained, it's being dried up by the heat of reality. The reason why we are constantly bombarded with this nonsense and obvious falsehood about Islamophobia and the rest of it is because it's so obviously false. They have to keep repeating the big lie so as to overwhelm the evidence of our senses. Don't believe your lion eyes, believe this, but they have to keep repeating it because it's so obviously false. They are now growing increasingly desperate, and this is why they are cracking down. It's probably going to get worse before it gets better, but the one element that we have, the one huge weapon that we have that they don't have, is that we're telling the truth. And they cannot possibly block the truth out the truth can never be blotted out forever. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the great Soviet dissident, he said that living in the Soviet Union, it was like being a blade of grass and being paved over with concrete and all the light was shut out and it was suffocating and there was nothing. But the blades of grass are stronger than the concrete and they fight through and they break it because life is always stronger than death. Our opponents, the jihadis, are very forthright about it. We love death. They say, we will win because we love death more than you love life. And that's why I can stand here with total confidence and serenity tonight and say, actually, we will win because we love life more than they love death. And because life always conquers death. And so take heart, this is going to be a hard struggle, but there's no way we can lose, ultimately in the long run. The truth will out, reality will out, and the light is already breaking. Thank you very much.
Okay, lights please, Tom Ashby. And folks, we're gonna do some Q&A, but unlike some previous meetings, please keep it down. People in the audience want to hear the questions. They also want to hear the answers. If you want to ask questions, please line up over here. And Bev will take, start with the mic. If you're going to have a private conversation, please take it out in the hall. We'll do a little bit of, uh, go up there, right there. Thank you very much. Now, if you're going to leave, we'll see you in May. Watch your emails for all the necessary information about all the upcoming events and of course our May 22nd meeting. I never ask a question, but I'm going to ask you a question. Hello. Please tell us, hi, you've been wonderful. Thank you. Uh, please tell us, how did you meet David Horowitz and how did Jihad Watch become part of the David Horowitz Freedom Center? I started Jihad Watch in October 2003 on my own and then in the summer of 2006, the uh, people from the Horowitz Center, um, acting obviously in line with what David Horowitz wanted also, but I hadn't met him at that time, they said, we would like you to come on board and run a uh, website tracking jihad activity in the US and around the world. And I said, well, I'm already doing that. Why don't we just join forces? It was this, this, just that they asked me, and it's worked out very well. David Horowitz is one of the great heroes of our age a uh, communist who saw the light. His books I highly recommend, especially Radical Son, and a book he wrote with Peter Collier, Destructive Generation, both of extraordinary explorations of the whole ethos of the 60s and the left, which is, of course, even more powerful now than it was then. And so I'm very proud of the association. Thanks for that. One second. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm asked to tell you I have three books here for signing, and they are for sale. $20 each. Uh, Arab Winter Comes to America, which has a great deal of uh, information about what I was saying about Nidal Hassan and other uh, jihad attacks that could and should have been prevented if it hadn't been for fear of Islamophobia. And The Complete Infidel's Guide to ISIS and The Complete Infidel's Guide to Iran. Collect them, trade them, get the whole set. <laughs> and you spoke so much. Uh, I heard you on I, I hear you're on the radio with various other people. Um, I was reading something about the Trump administration and maybe the swamp is getting to him. And I wanted to know if you know or do you have anybody here that talks to him that knows whether or not he's vacillating on this stuff? And what do you know and how close can you get to him to say, hey, stop it? Well, he doesn't return my calls, he doesn't answer my emails, but uh, I do know people who know him. Uh, I know Steve Bannon. Steve Bannon very famously said last summer that to me, Trump is listening to people like you and uh, the left has been quite hysterical over that. Um, I was just asked, as a matter of fact, by PBS to be part of their latest hit piece on Bannon. Uh, I declined because there's just no way that they're going to be fair to him or to me. But uh, they're very upset that Bannon knows me and I know him and that we agree on these things. And of course, uh, his position in the administration right now is a little bit unclear. And I don't know more about it from what uh, has been reported. I also have a great regard for Stephen Miller, who's very much in the background, but uh, quite influential. He's a brilliant young man. He uh, used to work for the Harwood Center and I knew him there. And now he uh, is in the administration. He's said to have helped to write the inaugural address and other things that Trump has given. And he's, he's just a superb individual with tremendous uh, insight and clarity of vision about these issues. And so I'm very happy that he's there. And then there are the other guys. But like I say, it's, it's, it hasn't played out yet. We don't really know which way it's gonna come down. Could President Trump have simply ignored the uh, the, the judgment of the of the judge in uh, in Hawaii, let's say, uh, claiming that the, the judge has no jurisdiction over what Trump is permitted to do. I'm not a lawyer, and uh, especially not a constitutional lawyer, so uh, I'm not really sure. But it does seem to me that there's more he could have done, and. Uh, 
That's our Skype connection. That's my uh, superiors. I have to report back to Moscow. Um, anyway, uh, I think that there's more he could have done, certainly, in terms of noting what I said during the talk that these judges did not address the relevant law, so he's going to enforce the relevant law. The, the law is, I used to actually, I might have it here. I do have it here. I used it in an old talk, and it's still in my Quran, which I don't leave home without. Whenever, whenever the president finds that the entry of any aliens into the U.S. would be detrimental to the interests of the United States, he may by proclamation, and for such period as he shall deem necessary, suspend the entry of all aliens, or any class of aliens, as immigrants or non-immigrants, or impose on the entry of aliens any restrictions he may deem to be appropriate. That's a very sweeping law. And it was not mentioned in those, ex uh, in those blocks of the executive order. So I think my untutored, unconstitutional lawyer view is that he could have said, well, the law says this, and those blocks did not address the law, so I'm going to enforce this law. Now, of course, he should be pressing, it seems to me, to take it to the Supreme Court. And I haven't seen him doing that yet either, but I hope he will. When will you sue the talking heads for libel and slander for calling you a racist? Yeah. I can't sue the talking heads for libel and slander for calling me a racist. I've actually looked into it, but the, I'm told that this is something that they can say is an opinion that they sincerely hold, and in their judgment it's accurate, and therefore, and also the libel laws are, are, are stricter for public figures. For some reason you can lie about public figures, but not about private individuals. So. Uh, anyway, it, it, there's no way I can do that, and it's unfortunate because I certainly would love to sue the Southern Poverty Law Center, for example, for saying that I'm a hate, I'm actually s several hate group leaders, I think I'm three. Uh, but in any case, the, uh, the, yes, the American Freedom Defense Initiative, Jihad Watch, David Harwood's Freedom Center, and me as an individual, I'm four hate groups, right here in front of me, and like two minutes in one. Um, but uh, in any case, there's, the, there's just no recourse uh, on that basis. And they, they know the law very well, and they skirt it very candidly on their side. Okay. Um, excellent presentation, by the way. Thank you. Um, my question is with regards to Europe. Uh, the, why are they letting all these people in? What's, what's Imagine the there's no countries. It's, it's, it's a, it, they, they do believe that, so see, Europe's, not, it, Europe's trauma is World War II. The United States, it's Jim Crow and racism and slavery. In Europe, it's World War II. But what's wrong with World War II? The diagnosis in Europe is that it was nationalism. Hitler was a nationalist, and the nationalists are bad guys, and nationalism leads, leads to genocide. And so if you want to defend national borders in Europe now, you're a Nazi. And so, and that's the last thing any European wants to be. So, they're letting in all these people because they are internationalists. And they want to, as I say, erase distinctions between people, make every place pretty much like every other place. And if you resist because you say, well, Sweden is for the Swedes, Norway is for the Norwegians, Germany is for the Germans. Well, you're a Nazi then. And you cannot stand up for the national character or a national culture without getting such charges. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be dead. There will be no more Sweden, no more Germany. Yes. Um, good evening. Um, good evening. My question is more grassroots. I was a founder of my tea party in the city of Euclid. <laughs> Recently, I became the vice president of the Republican Party. I even attended the Donald Trump rally with my neighbors and friends in Cleveland. You mentioned that Donald Trump might be a little slow about draining the swamp. What can we as a group specifically do to encourage him to move forward with his agenda? Well, we have to make it very clear that he is only there at our sufferance, and that if he does not drain the swamp and instead jumps in, 
then we'll throw them out. And we have to make very clear that we're not going to stand for any more of this nonsense from any of the establishment Republicans. The Democrats forget about it, but the, uh, the, the problem is we've been willing to play along for so long. You know, they said McCain, and we said okay, and they said Romney, and we said okay. And they were just the same party, really, as the Democrats. George Wallace said it, this is not to endorse George Wallace, George Wallace said it back in 1968, there's not a dime's worth of difference between the two parties. And if anything became clear in 2016, it was that that, that was true. That the it was Donald Trump on one side, and McCain, Romney, Paul Ryan, and the Democrats on the other side. In other words, it was the establishment Republicans and the Democrats who were all one big thing for internationalism, maybe just a little slower for the Republicans, but still the same internationalist thing, and Islam is a religion of peace and all the nonsense versus Trump. So if Trump joins that conglomerate, then we gotta throw him out and find another. That's all, and on the very localist level, most local level, find people who are on that on board with that and understand that that has got to be the defining issue, that we are not going to accept this establishment politics anymore. That is the only thing that we can do now. One of yes, our members wants me to read the phone number to the White House to you, so I'll read it twice. It's 202-456-1111. I'll repeat that one more time. 202-456-1111. And if you didn't get it, check with Jamie at the end. Next person. You tell Donald I said hi. You never know with him, he might answer. The other day he came out, I mean, this is, the great thing about him is, he, he, you know, Obama stopped the tours in the White House saying that it was because the Republicans were cutting taxes, so he cut the national parks and the White House tours and all those things, just to spite the American people. And Trump restored the White House tours and then went out and said hello to the people. You know, you gotta love that. But I hope he follows through with some genuine populist legislation. Yes, sir. I have one question, then I'll return when I see you. <clears throat> okay. um, what's being done to change the hearts and the minds of the FBI and other uh, law enforcement organizations? As far as I know, nothing. And I don't think that, that the Trump administration so far has a real awareness of how deep the rot really is in those agencies. But there are people, obviously we know that there are people in the CIA who hate the president and are trying to destroy him with false charges. We know that the FBI is full of people who think that, well, think that people who draw Muhammad ought to get killed as an example for the rest of the American people. And no, as far as I know, that's not being addressed. I did see one story in the New York Post in February that was very encouraging that said that Rex Tillerson, the Secretary of State, is purging top State Department officials. That was great. That was the best news I've read in weeks and weeks, maybe longer. That uh, the people who are responsible for all these failed policies that keep being reapplied, he was sweeping out. And so that's all to the good. We can hope it's happening in the FBI and the CIA and the rest of them, but there's been no public sign of it so far. Nikki Haley, I was very concerned about her positions on immigration when we heard her positions and then she got selected to be the UN ambassador. Do you have any concerns there, or are you okay with that? Well, so far she's been aces. Okay. You know, um, it hasn't, the immigration issue has not come up for her at the UN, but she's been tremendous. She's been so great there, saying that we're gonna stand with our ally, we're not gonna put up with any more of this defamation of Israel that's relentless at the UN because it's controlled by the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. And, uh, she's followed through on that. And so that's such a change from the Obama UN that was going along with the vilification of Israel. Israel is on the front line of the global jihad. If you are against the jihad in the United States, you have to be in favor of Israel. It's just that simple. And so it's good to see that she has been. Excellent, excellent presentation. Uh, I, real quick, Three quick uh, ideas that I had. Uh, number one, uh, well, it's more or less a question, uh, about a shadow government that you hear about 
is that true, number one? And number two, what can we do to have our own version of the media, like a conservative media, maybe a billionaire out there buys up, you know, MSNBC, etc. Third thing, the Koran. You obviously are very knowledgeable about the Koran. Is it possible to uh, uh, give that knowledge to Trump that this is from the Koran, read the verse, etc., et and so that he understands that, and then he could disseminate that to the Department of Education and teach our children about it? Well, you know, taking the last one first, uh, like I say, he doesn't return my calls, he doesn't answer my emails. I, I can't just walk in and talk to him. Uh, I know people who I trust there who are very good. I'm hoping that they're talking to him about these things. I don't know. Uh, he does seem to be a remarkable combination of uh, arrogance and humility. You know, he's uh, extraordinary. He struts around and boasts all the time, and yet he seems to also be willing to learn new ideas and consider new perspectives in a way that's actually unusual for politicians. And then, unfortunately, he seems to be learning them from the other side at this point. But that doesn't mean that that's going to be the way it is forever. Uh, the media, yes, we do need alternative media. I do urge you to support the alternative media that's there now. Uh, Jihadwatch.org, uh, PamelaGeller.com, uh, all the other sites of that kind, the ReligionOfPeace.org that, that are out there that are telling the truth about these issues. Uh, especially because our readership is being choked off by these Facebook and Twitter bans. YouTube, Google, they're all blocking us. So. Go to those sites, try to make a point of going to uh, counteract that and to show that there is support. Uh, I don't know of any billionaires, we do need that, yes, especially with Fox going the other way now. Oh, and the shadow government, I think, it, yeah, I think it's obvious that it exists, just given what's happened, all the leaks, that they can't do anything without it immediately being in the papers the next day, and the... Uh, the, the, uh, all the strange, spurious charges about Russia uh, that, that's, that are based on various surveillance of various Trump officials. It seems obvious there are people in the government trying to bring down this administration. I hope he brings them down first. I have to be one of the alternative... alternative uh, there you go. Subscribe to Liberty News. Liberty News and... Uh, you can see it at libertyohio.org. All the issues going all the way back to uh, January 2009. I do bash the Muslims every month. I'm reaching about 30,000 people every month. And I'd love to put your articles in the news as well. Thank you. Permission to do that? Sure. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Joe, you rock. Everybody should love you here. Thank you. And uh, I think it was very pretty. Yes, I think you're sticking your neck out, and I think you're doing good. Thank you very much. What's the difference between a radical Islamist and a devout Islamist? What's the difference between a radical Islamist and a devout Islamist? Well, that's what a devout Islamist is. Uh, you know, the president spoke repeatedly about radical Islamic terrorism. He hasn't lately, which is not a good sign, but he did say it repeatedly. And I was very happy because he said Islamic at all after eight years of denial. But the fact is that radical Islamic terrorism is mainstream Islam. The Quran teaches warfare against unbelievers. Muhammad taught warfare against unbelievers. There's nothing radical about it. It's just ordinary Islam. And that doesn't mean that every Muslim is going to do it. Like I said, any more than every Christian turns the other cheek and loves his enemy. But it's in the texts. It's core Islam. So it's uh, a little bit unfortunate that we have to always say radical. I mean, I actually never do. Because it is mainstream Islam. Because the implication when you say radical is that there's some sort of ordinary Islam that's perfectly harmless. And there isn't. As long as there are people who believe in the Quran and Allah, there are people who will, among them, think that they have to wage jihad against unbelievers. That's inescapable.
I have a quick announcement to make. On Tuesday, May 23rd, 2017, there's going to be a special showing, one night only, of the movie produced by CBN, it's Christian Broadcasting Network. It's called In Our Hands, the Battle for Jerusalem. This year is the 50th anniversary of the Jewish people taking back the city of Jerusalem, and especially the Temple Mount. And the title, In Our Hands, comes from Major General Moniker, when they stormed the Temple Mount and they got it, that's the message he broadcast to the world. The Temple Mount is in our hands. Now, uh, you can go to the website, it's inourhands1967.com, and they will give you all the information. You, you punch in your uh, zip code, and they'll tell you what theaters are playing the movie. And uh, if a lot of people show up, they'll extend the run. Right now, it's only one night only. Excellent, thank you. Okay, I'll be the last question here. <clears throat> Robert, talk, we talked briefly at dinner. Tell our audience about Karen Armstrong. <laughs> Karen Armstrong is one of the go-to people about Islam, for, as a matter of fact, for the U.S. government in the Bush administration. And she's a uh, darling of the left. She's the author of Islam, A Short History, as well as two biographies of Muhammad. She likens Muhammad to Gandhi, which is sort of like likening Hitler to Benjamin Netanyahu. And in any case, Karen Armstrong is very influential. It was on the basis of her uh, teachings about Islam that the Bush administration formulated the idea that it would go into Iraq and Afghanistan and that we would be welcomed as liberators and they would set up Western-style secular republics. They believed that because people like Karen Armstrong and John Esposito and others were telling them that Islam is completely compatible with democracy and that there is no political Islam that is going to cause any trouble. Whereas the vast majority of the people in Iraq and Afghanistan believe that only Sharia, the political system of Islam, is the legitimate government. And they were never going to accept democracy or secular rule. But they were listening to the wrong people. So they went in with the wrong expectations and everything went wrong. And this is uh, the deleterious effect that Karen Armstrong had and still continues to have over large segments of the churches as well as the uh, intelligence and, uh, and law enforcement communities. She is uh, an ex-nun who is extraordinarily hostile to Christianity and very whitewashed when she writes about Islam. She tells essentially the leftist intelligentsia what they want to hear so they love her. But her influence, because she is telling things, saying things that are patently false, that are misleading and untrue, she has been responsible for a lot of policy blind alleys on the part of the US government and on the part of the churches in their pursuit of this dialogue with Muslim groups. Okay, I'm gonna take one more question after mine, but I want to wrap. Uh, tie this together for you about Karen Armstrong. Why does Karen Armstrong mean anything to this group? Because members from this group were at St. Basil's Catholic Church at a refugee meeting a year ago in December. And I've told the story to some people, but maybe some of you haven't heard this. It was a week after San Bernardino. There's 200 people in the room, 100 for taking the refugees, 100 against taking the refugees went back and forth. My friend here that's going to ask the next, next question actually <laughs> was there and blurted out and stepped out because he had had enough of the nonsense. Anyway, um, the point being, we're at this meeting, it's contentious. Finally, a guy sticks his hand up and says, I thought we were here but to help the refugees. Let's get to the matter. So I shot my hand up. And I asked for the microphone. The priest came over and gave it to me. <laughs> and I said, well, that's a good point. And I said, Sister Helen, that's the, the nun over there at St. Basil's, right down here on Route 21. I said, what programs do we have in place to bring these refugees to Jesus? <clears throat> silence. There was silence. I swear to God, you can hear a pin drop. And people all of a sudden murmurs behind me, whispers, what a great question. Okay, the nun doesn't know what to say. It seemed like an hour passed, or you know, 15 minutes, or 30 seconds probably. And then she said, finally, 
Well, it's not about that. It's about just helping people. So I said, well, as a matter of fact, I said, Senator Ted Cruz has introduced legislation, and at that, the priest came and took the microphone from me. He had no idea what I was about to say. And what I was going to say was that Senator Cruz introduced the Muslim Brotherhood Terrorist Designation Act. And what that would do would prevent the mosques, like in San Bernardino, controlled by the Muslim Brotherhood, from being operated in this country. And then I was going to take it a step further. So unless we bring these refugees to Jesus, they're going to go to those Muslim Brotherhood mosques. And I couldn't get my point out because right away he said, we're not talking politics. He takes the microphone, ends the meeting. We had 45 minutes left to go in the meeting. Now we have 200 people, like half the room mad at me for stopping the meeting. When I didn't stop it, they did. It gets better. We're all getting our clothes, uh, to, our, our coats on, etc., milling around a little bit and ready to leave. The priest comes up to me, so does the nun, and another one. And they say, you know, you really ought to read Karen Armstrong. Oh. Oh. This is why I brought this up. So, shouldn't they be for Catholic doctrine? Didn't they take vows somewhere along the line? Yeah. And now they're... Well, Sister Jude, I'm sorry, I said Sister Alice. So, well, Sister Jude. Okay. Then I did a little, so I did a little investigation on Ms. Or, or Ms. Uh, Karen Armstrong. Turns out she's involved with something else called the Parliament of Rural Religions, which is all a big, huge interfaith thing. Um, and they just, they, they're all about climate change and climate refugees and taking care of Mother Earth, etc. Have to look some, do some digging this weekend, as a matter of fact. On their international advisors, one of them is Huma Abedin's mother. So it continues to get better, folks. The more you dig, the more this just, you can't make this stuff up. You know, Dan, I think in light of that, I, one more thing about Karen Armstrong. She reviewed my biography of Muhammad for Financial Times about 10 years ago, and she said how terrible it was that, you know, I made Muhammad look out to be a bad guy. And she said he doesn't even quote the Quran verse that says, fighting is an awesome evil. She's trying to make out that the Quran is pacifist. Now, I wanted to read to you to show how dishonest these people are. I wanted to read to you the whole passage. It's chapter 2, verse 217 of the Quran. People ask you about fighting in the holy month. Say, fighting in it is an awesome evil. But, barring people from the way of Allah, disbelieving in Him, and denying entry into the holy mosque, and expelling its inmates from it, are more awesome acts in the sight of Allah. And persecution is even more heinous than killing. In other words, if you're being persecuted, then kill the people who are persecuting you. And even if you are fighting in the sacred month, you can go ahead and kill them. So it's actually saying, go and kill the people, and she was claiming that it meant just the opposite, because she only used a bit of the verse. And this is the kind of dishonesty, the kind of inveterate mendaciousness that is guiding American policy today. Robert, I want to thank you for your time and your presentation. Thank you. My question is this. The madrasas that are being funded by Saudi Arabia, and the enormous mosques that are being built throughout America, can you name me one politician that will stop dead oil money from the oil kingdom to keep producing these madrasas because most of you in this room don't understand the oil kingdom pays the jihadists to go away. Yes, they have a deal. The jihadis don't strike in Saudi and the Saudis fund them elsewhere. And 80% of American mosques are uh, owned by the Saudis. And yeah, the North American Islamic Trust is a Saudi organization that owns the deeds to 80% of American mosques. Not coincidentally, four separate and independent studies since 1998 have all found independently of one another that 80% of mosques in the United States teach hatred of Jews and Christians and the necessity ultimately to replace Islamic law, to replace the Constitution with Islamic law. It's also a funny thing. Um, I have this mailbox across town from where I live because I didn't want to get mail at home. 
And you might uh, think, well, it's not very kind of you to have a mailbox there, because then they're just going to get blown up. But so far, it hasn't happened. And anyway, it's funny coincidence. I don't know. Accidents happen, I guess. I uh, got this mailbox address and started using it, and then they put the mosque next door. <laughs> so I make sure not to go on Friday noon to get the mail, because, well, you can imagine. But the funny thing about the mosque is, it, this is in, a, is in a strip mall, and it's up above on the second floor with entry is only by way of going into a door and going up an elevator. Entry is very difficult, but oversight from that is very easy. I was speaking in Las Vegas a few years back, and when I finished, the organizer made me the offer that pretty much every tourist in Las Vegas is given, let's go to the local mosque. So we went to the local mosque, and he said, he pointed it out to me, Look how there are no windows on the first floor, and the windows on the second floor are slit windows that you can fire out of easily, but you can't get hit coming in. And look at the cameras and how they're following us as we drive in the parking lot. It's built like a fortress, and mosques all over the country are built like that. Why is that? They all are. And you got to wonder. Now, what politician is going to stand up against this? Well, I think that the, the president has already shown signs that he wants to stop the oil hegemony, the Saudi hegemony, because he is working on finding alternative energy sources and opening up the drilling and the fracking and the pipelines and all that that Obama had stopped. That will ultimately wean us from dependence on the Saudis, which will kill the jihad money. So that's all to the good. Thank you very much. I'll be over here. I will keep that.